Belinda Biffin and I work at Front Yard Youth Services, which is a part of Melbourne City Mission. Yeah, I guess homelessness we sort of define as someone who doesn't have safe, stable, ongoing accommodation. So it doesn't just apply to those who may not uh, have a roof over their head, it doesn't just apply to those who are sleeping rough, it can actually apply to someone who's perhaps doing something like couch surfing. Tonight, as you sleep in your bed, one in every 200 Aussies are homeless. This equates to around 0.5% of the population. Of the 105,237 people that are homeless in Australia, on any given night, 6% are sleeping rough in improvised dwellings or tents. 17% are residing in boarding houses. 20% are staying in supported homeless accommodation. 39% are living in severely overcrowded dwellings. 17% are staying temporarily with other households and 1% are staying in other temporary dwellings. The homeless community also has a varying range of age groups. In Victoria, 3,638 people are under the age of 12, 2,283 are aged 12 to 18, 3,834 are aged 19 to 24, 4,581 are 25 to 34, 3,177 are 35 to 44, 2,548 are 45 to 54, and the remaining 2,338 people are aged over 55. It is really, really high at the moment. Um, I think in the last two years, just in the CBD, there's been a 74% increase, which is ridiculous. Um, I think lack of affordable housing options is probably one of the really big reasons. Um, you know, if you're a young person and you're not lucky enough to have family support, you're gonna do it really tough trying to find some, you know, private rental or, or any form of accommodation, to be honest. And, and that, means that a lot of people get left with very, very limited options. And if they have, you know, other problems as well, if they've got mental health issues, if they're struggling with drug and alcohol issues, then all of those things add up to make it really difficult to find somewhere safe and stable to live. depression and stuff and yeah um, had a relationship breakdown and yeah deaths in the family um, got my parents and stuff or my mum and um, now yeah, so basically I, I lost any support I had and um, yeah I ended up on the streets you know like um, I was raised in the system <laughs> So that's why I mean by like I've been out here since I was 12 practically because I used to run away a lot. Don't know my family, so when I turn 
18 and I got kicked out, I ended up out here. I've got no Centrelink, I've got nothing. A uh, series of circumstances. Um, I was in a long-term relationship and that broke down. And I started drinking after I found out she was pregnant to another guy. Um, after about three months, of, that was my coping mechanism. So I've been doing AA now for, goodness, seven months. So, so just shy, shy of seven months, probably six and a half months. So I, I haven't had a drink now for five months. Um, so it's just a matter of clawing my way back up now because I don't even get Centrelink payments because I don't have a postal address. So it's, the government's got that a little bit backwards. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, at Front Yard, we work with young people in particular, and definitely the number one cause of youth homelessness is family breakdown by a clear mile. So we do work with lots of young people who have either experienced violence in the family home or just really, really significant um, conflict, and that's often what's led to them having to leave the family home. This is it, man. What you see, it. get up, read, go and get some money up for some food. It's been a slow day. Um, yeah, so I was just reading until I can get like enough money up for a pie or something, you know? Um, wake up, go around, try and get housing, um, go to a couple of the agencies, like have, have, have breakfast or lunch, um, try and do some washing, um, yeah, and come out around the city and Basically, beg for money uh, or food, clothes, toiletries um, to get through, you know, to try and get through the day. Go up to Salvo's and just find something to eat, isn't it? Go and get down there. Yeah, I'm on waiting lists everywhere, basically. Um, but being that I'm a single male, you know, I've got no kids that I'm looking after, I'm not female. We're at the bottom of the list, you know, and there's not enough housing at all. And what housing there is, is so expensive, like it's way beyond my means. Like, um, yeah. Um, well, I've got no ID, so it's pretty impossible. I don't have Centrelink, I've got nothing. Oh yeah, like I'm on that many waiting lists and that many, I've got support, but it's, it's just, um, you know, these promises from the government, it's just a myth, you know, there's no extra housing, there's no nothing like that, and, you know, so yeah, I have made several attempts and we're actually just waiting on a few answers now, it'll be early, or sometime in the next week we'll find out. Um, whether we've got our place or not. <laughs> Homelessness is a vicious cycle that many people struggle to break. Although everyone's story is different, the cycle of chronic homelessness can be widely applied. For most it begins with the loss of a substantial income. They will often seek government assistance, which can result in dependence on the welfare system. Unable to pay their rent or mortgage, the individual or family become homeless. This can cause a variety of problems, including mental illness, a higher likelihood of domestic violence, substance abuse, and engagement with the justice system. They struggle to obtain a job or accommodation because of a lack of sustainable income, a lack of references, and in some cases, a criminal record. Their use of homeless shelters and crisis centres increases as a result of unaffordable housing. Even if they are able to get a job, they are likely to still be dependent on the welfare system, which, in the event of another job loss, can begin the cycle once more. Yeah, I think sometimes once someone does become homeless, it can be a bit of a spiral that they get into. And I guess part of our role as a support service is to try and break that cycle, um, which is a little easier said than done. Um, but the great thing about working with young people is that you do have a really good opportunity to break the cycle so they don't just have to keep going through that revolving door that sometimes, sometimes you know, that can be someone's experience of the system. Yeah, like, 
York, I think we got we most of your money on drugs and shit, but most of the time. The latest stereotype is that all homeless people are on drugs, which isn't true because, well, I don't do drugs and I don't even drink alcohol. There's quite a few actually. Um, you know, it's a shame that, that we're all generalised and, and put in the same basket, that we're all junkies, that we're all alcoholics, that we're all violent. And let's face it, a lot of homeless people are. So that's where this the perception comes from. But we're not all like that. And, and um, you know, I live myself in literature, mate. That's my escapism, you know. Um, yeah, it's, that's one of the most annoying things. That we're drug addicts, we're all drug addicts. That it's a choice that we want to be out here. I don't want to be out here. I don't want to sleep under a bridge. I don't like being looked down on. You know, like, it's shameful, it's, it's depressing. It's not, it's not good, you know. Like, I don't choose to be out here. I do anything to get housing, I do anything to get a job. You know, I do any kind of work. And yeah, obviously I'm not on drugs. Um, I don't drink alcohol. I smoke cigarettes, it's about it. And I take my prescription medication. I, I do get Centrelink payments. I get about $400 a fortnight. I'm on, my medication is over $200 a fortnight. I, I think the, the misconception is that everyone who is on the street is a drug addict. I think that's probably something that gets applied to most people um, who are sleeping rough, at least. Um, but also, I would say one of the one of the common misconceptions is the fact that if you're homeless, it doesn't just mean you're someone who's sleeping rough. You're not necessarily sleeping in a park or on the streets. You could be someone who's couch surfing, and if you are, you tend to be a little bit more invisible. So I think that's actually one of the real misconceptions that you have to be on the streets and yet, to be honest, that only makes up about 6% of the homeless population. So the other 94% are either staying in really, really unsafe, horrible rooming houses or maybe they're just so transient they're moving from one place to the next. Yeah. You don't have to go in that, so I'm pretty safe now. Did you go to him? Agro. How long have you had it? Three years. No, no, no. Like I'm lucky, like I'm a male, um, and I'm not like small, and I can sort of look after myself, but it's not safe out here. You know, like a lot of drunk people come, and I've had to try to extinguish the lead off of my face. I've been kicked in the head, I've been, I've been attacked. Um, a place where I used to sleep, I woke up getting attacked by about four drunk um, like Islander, big Islander boys. They drunk and yeah, they sold me possessions and attacked me and I ended up with a fractured nose, cheekbone, eye socket, all my dentures got broken. Yeah, so yeah, not good. I used to before my best friend went away. Three weeks ago. Doesn't matter what happened to him. Off camera, Summer revealed to us that she'd been struggling with the death of her best friend three weeks prior to our interview. Oh, well, every day is a struggle, and you know, it's safe. That's why I sleep as annoying as it is. The trams and the drunks on the weekends and the and the you know, just the constant. I sleep here because it is safe. In an alley or in a park or somewhere secluded. You know, here you're in this constant people, constant shops. You know, so if someone does try and do something to you while you're asleep or something like that, you've got people around that'll hopefully help you know, if someone's attacking you or something, you know. Yep, 
So we specialise in helping young people and we try to work with them in a really holistic way. So that means when someone comes in, they're usually in the middle of a crisis, to be honest, and that does often mean that they'll be presenting with lots of significant issues. But we recognise that if someone is homeless, it doesn't just mean they don't have a roof over their head. It can also mean they've got mental health issues, they've got drug and alcohol issues, they're you know, completely disconnected with family, they may have left school many years ago. Um, so we try to pick up on all of those different issues and then link them into appropriate support. So we're really, really lucky at Front Yard that we have lots of services in the one building. So a young person can come to Front Yard and instead of having to go to you know, half a dozen different services that are all scattered in different suburbs, they can come to one place and get their issues dealt with. Uh, about 70% is government funding and that's a combination of federal, state and local government. And the other 30% is kind of made up of, I guess, uh, corporate uh, sponsorship and partnerships. And even things like, you know, lots of school groups come and visit our service and, you know, afterwards walk away, uh, you know, a little bit disgusted that some young people are so disadvantaged and so they'll go off and have little fundraisers and that money goes towards being able to run, you know, some of the programs that perhaps wouldn't get government funding. Yes, so, so right behind me here is Enterprise Park, um, which is right beside the Yarra. And Enterprise Park is probably the most notable spot in all of Melbourne where people sleep rough at night. Um, I dare say it's probably also the spot that in the last two and a half years has gotten a lot of media publicity. And that unfortunately is because it's the very spot where an older gentleman who had been homeless really since he was a teenager, um, about two and a half years ago, while he was sleeping rough, was repeatedly stabbed and killed. So it's the very spot where he lost his life. Um, Wayne Morgan Perry was his name. Um, everyone knew him as Mouse. Um, he was a very well-known person within the community. And I think after that particular horrible, tragic case, Enterprise Park uh, got a lot of attention and, and to this very day, every single night, there are people sleeping down here. Rather ironically, Enterprise Park is located directly opposite Crown Casino. On one side of the river, you have the people flushing their money down the drain in the hope of further growing their wealth, while on the other side are the people who can't even afford a roof over their heads. It's as if the Yarra separates the haves and the have-nots. Probably over at SA, living over there, working over there, hopefully. What's your drink job? I'm a forklift driver, but there's no work, eh? It's too hard to get work. Well, I want to get housing for a start. And once I get housing, well, I want to, I want to um, go and study youth work and become a youth worker. Because I think because of my experience that, um, you know, I'd, obviously I've been through it, so I'd be able to help people, help youth, and um, yeah, that's my dream, you know, but until I get housing, it's, it's not going to be a reality, you know, because I can't do it living under a bridge, you know, and, um, you know, you need to be able to do washing and be presentable, and, yeah, so that's, that's my dreams, and I hope they come to fruition sooner rather than later. I don't know. I'll see what it brings. Hopefully I get out of here. Yeah, just to um, have a bit more compassion for the people that are less fortunate and 
you know, we don't all choose to, to live this life. We're not all drug addicts. And the government needs to pull the finger out of their bum and, and do something about more housing. It's, a, it's all well and good having people come from other countries and putting them in public housing. But what about the people from this country? You know, I was born and bred here. I worked for years, paid taxes for years. Yeah. What about helping me, giving me some housing? Because, you know, we need it, you know? Get a book. Stop helping people from other countries when Australian, like, Australian people need the, our people first. And um, don't go judging everyone just by what they look like. find somewhere for accommodation and all that. Because there's like heaps of empty buildings and everything. Like through North Melbourne and everything. There's like go to every, nearly every four or five houses, they're always empty. And, and the houses and the pulling houses down and selling them. They're not giving anyone housing. Oh, that's a good mindset. Yeah. Yeah. Just take the time to um to, to, to talk to people, to talk to people in the situation and asking the situation rather than judging them straight away. Maybe try and find out a bit more about them and, and try and get the information and then make a judgment. Because, you know, we don't, we don't all choose. Some people do choose to live this life. You know, I'm, I'm one of the ones that don't. And I'd do anything to get out of it. And, um, yeah, if people just took the time, you know, it's not all about money. You know, sometimes just taking two or three minutes to talk to someone and make sure they're alright, it's just as good. I'm not sure, and that's a tricky question, like, I mean, money helps most, I guess. It really does, like, let's be practical here, it does help. There's only so many care packages that we can take before, you know, we can't carry too much. And, so I guess things are nice to accept and take, but too much and it becomes clutter and we chuck half of it in the bin because we can't carry it all. Um, so yeah, it's a tricky question. So just acknowledge that they're still humans, mate. You know? Just acknowledge that, yeah, you know, that this could happen to anyone, mate. You don't have savings, and you haven't. Um, you know, there's only so long you can couch surf for. And if you don't have a pay for, if you don't get paid for five or six weeks, no income for say two months, and you've got no savings, well, you can only couch surf for so long. Right? Happen to anyone? People, who real people, especially if they're living month to month, fortnight to fortnight. You know, I realise everybody, that's why I won't, I don't verbally ask anybody for anything. Because I realise people have a lot going on in their own personal lives and in their work lives. And, you know, that's why I just sit here and read and, and um, if someone wants to help me, thank you, I'm grateful. I won't ask, I won't put pressure, I won't put people in a position where they feel awkward and have to say yes or no. So, you know, I just, for me it's just about getting by and, um, trying to just not fall into the cracks, mate. <laughs> well, look, I, I tend to think one of the most effective ways that people can make a difference is really trying to tap into a question you asked before about that, that horrible cycle of homelessness. I think what we try and do as a support service is break the cycle, because if you break it when someone's young, they can go on to not experience homelessness as an adult. So, I mean, I find a really effective thing that lots of students do who visit our service is they do go off and have little fundraisers and often those fundraisers do things like they provide funding for us to be able to run classes where people can learn how to cook for themselves. You know, if you're a young person and you're not lucky enough to have mum or dad support you, you've got to look after yourself. So you've got to learn how to do basic things like being able to cook, 
being able to shop on a budget. Those are things that we do a lot of at Front Yard, one of those life skills. And to be honest, they're the, they're the skills that people take with them and take with them throughout their whole life. So they're skills that, that people really need and they don't always get a chance to develop. So they're really practical things and I think people can make a difference. We're just one service, so I'm biased. <laughs> but I, th I would say to people who want to make a difference, have a look at what support is out there and try and find maybe a service that you think is, is doing good work and that really gels with your beliefs and your values and maybe find a way to support them to, to help the young people who are doing it really, really tough.